Welcome to Talks at Google. Uh, please join me today in welcoming Bay Area journalist Marina Krakowski, the author of The Middleman Economy, just published. Marina's, Marina's writing has appeared in the New York Times Magazine, the Washington Post, the Stanford Magazine, Scientific American, Discover, Psychology Today, and Slate. Uh, Marina was also a researcher or, on Eric Schmidt and Jonathan's uh, book, uh, How Google Works. Uh, Marina has earned a BA in English from Stanford University. Thank you for coming to Google today. Thank you. All right, so I'm here to tell you that we're all middlemen. I'm a middleman, you guys are middlemen. And what I will say is why I say that, and also I'll give you ways to think about how you can be a better middleman. So if we think back to the day when the internet was still in its early years and people were all trying to figure out what's this going to mean for all of us, a lot of people were saying that the internet's uh, radical ability to connect everybody would make middlemen obsolete. Bill Gates actually wrote in his 1995 book, The Road Ahead, that the internet itself would become the ultimate go-between, the universal middleman. He foresaw a time in the future when we wouldn't need to turn to middlemen, we would be able to do our own buying and selling directly. But if you look around 20 years later, you see very clearly that that actually has not happened. In fact, I'll argue that the opposite has happened, that the internet has made middlemen more prevalent and more valuable. So look at the biggest players on the internet. eBay and Amazon are middleman businesses. Uber and Airbnb are middleman businesses. Google is a middleman business, right? And I'm not just talking about tech giants, I'm also talking about individual middlemen who are thriving thanks to the tools of the internet. So think about eBay. Anybody can buy and sell directly through eBay, being a middleman, but most of the trade on eBay actually flows through resellers, through trusted middlemen on eBay. And on LinkedIn, something very similar happens. It's all about the recruiters. Recruiters bring in more of LinkedIn's revenue than all the other LinkedIn users combined. So the internet clearly didn't do away with middlemen. It's actually made them more efficient and often more effective at what they do. So, I've been thinking for a very long time about what, you know, what is the deal with middlemen, basically? I mean, it's so strange. Middlemen have been a part of every society that I know of throughout history. We've had middlemen, and yet people have often had very strong negative feelings about middlemen, feelings of resentment, anger, contempt, sometimes even disgust. And um, at the same time, you know, middlemen are still there. Or to put another way, if people are so eager to eliminate the middlemen, why have we never been able to do so? Okay, these are the driving questions behind my book, and that those are the questions that I really tried to answer. So I talked to economists and psychologists and sociologists who think about such issues, but also with ordinary or you might say extraordinary middlemen, people who I think do a great job and are doing just fine, thank you very much, in the age of the internet. So it's people that you might expect, like real estate agents and travel agents and car dealers, but also people that it might take you a moment to realize that they are middlemen too. So um, for example, gosh, a wedding planner is a middleman, if you pause to think about that, right? A venture capitalist is a middleman. A person who started a two-sided market, like open table, that's a middleman. Okay? There are middlemen all over. You know, gallerists are, are middlemen. Anytime you're dealing with any kind of broker or dealer or anybody who's connecting two groups of people, that's a middleman. 
And what's interesting from talking to all these different people is that even though they're from different industries, you start to see patterns. You start to see what they have in common that is making them as effective and successful as they are. And that's sort of what I started to do in my book, is to, to tease out those commonalities that are true everywhere. And although all the examples that I use throughout the book and throughout my presentation will be of professional middlemen, people who identify as middlemen in their jobs, I do believe that all of us are, are middlemen, in some, at least in some area of our work or in our personal lives. Okay. So, what do I mean by a middleman? I think we all have an intuition about this, and we think of a middleman as the person you know, connecting two groups of people or two individuals, the person in between. But I want to give you a more useful definition that explains what middlemen actually do. And this definition comes from a man named Mike Maples Jr. He's a venture capitalist here in the Valley started a fund called Floodgate that was an early investor in Lyft and TaskRabbit middleman businesses, as well as, of course, other startups. And he says this, a middleman is the person in a network who connects nodes in the network to increase the value of the network. I think it's a useful definition, and I'm going to talk a lot more about what that means. But I also want to acknowledge that middleman is a sexist word. Okay, I realize it's a sexist word, and I'm using it despite that, because I really think no other word will capture what I'm trying to do, which is really push against these cultural ideas about middlemen. You know, that word has these strong connotations. We just don't hear people saying, ah, let's cut out the intermediary. It's really about the middleman. So forgive me for using that word. There's, there's a reason. So going back to this idea that middlemen are people who increase the value of a network by connecting nodes, I do think it's a, it's a really helpful start. But it's not a complete definition. And the reason it's not complete is that not all connectors are of equal quality. Right? We know that. And if you think about uh, Metcalfe's Law, I would guess everybody in this room knows what that is. Metcalfe's Law, this uh, provocative claim that the value of a network grows quadratically with the number of connected users. Well, that may not be true. It may be true sometimes. It's certainly not true for every additional user you add to a network. And if you think about it in terms of middlemen, or if you think of it in terms of any kind of user, actually, if you have a network that has a certain value and you take out some of those nodes, sometimes taking out a single node will just decimate the network. It'll radically decrease the value of the network. And sometimes taking out a node will have almost no effect at all. And sometimes taking out a node will actually increase the value of the network because some of these connectors are actually having a net negative effect on the value of a network. So if you think about spammers, that would be an example of, of something like that. So it is really important to think about connectors quality. But how do you think about connectors quality? What is it that defines the quality of a connector or of a middleman? And the way I find it useful to think about it is in terms of these two dimensions. One is warmth, and the other is competence. Warmth and competence. And these are specialized terms that social psychologists use when they're talking about how we judge other people. So this isn't just true about middlemen. This is true about human judgment in general. When we meet somebody, we quickly evaluate them based on our perceptions of the person's warmth, which is all about their intentions. Are they friend or foe? Are they on my side or not? And competence, which is a separate issue, and that's really all about the ability to deliver on those intentions. And those are totally separate. And if you combine them, you quickly generate this nice uh, two by two matrix with four possible combinations. And I want to talk through each of these so you know what I'm talking about. I think that these, these labels that I've come up with really 
uh, capture some of the emotion and some of the ambivalence that we have about middlemen because middlemen are not all created equal. They really vary in quality uh, across these two dimensions. So clearly the worst type is the one I call the parasite person who is low in warmth and competence. Mm. After the financial crisis of 2008, a lot of people put the bankers on Wall Street in that quadrant. They've actually done studies on this, and companies like Goldman Sachs and AIG landed squarely in that cold, incompetent quadrant. Right? We don't need to say much about that. Um, what's more interesting is these um, ambivalent cases. So the predator, the person who is competent but really doesn't have your interests at heart, this is the person that we tend to resent. And I don't know about you guys, but this is how I feel about my cable company. Okay, they're competent, they're able to deliver high-speed internet and video to my home, but clearly they don't have my best interests at heart. They seem to be taking advantage of their monopolistic power for their personal gain, not for us. They have high prices, terrible customer service, um, all of that makes me think that they're not warm at all, even if they're competent. OK, now the pet is maybe a little bit better because they're at least on your side. But unfortunately, they can't really deliver on those good intentions. And to my mind, a good example would be sort of the stereotypical mom and pop shop. OK, so the service might be really slow. You might have to place a special order and wait for it to be delivered. Um, the prices are high, but it's not because they're trying to gouge you. They're not trying to take advantage of you. They really mean well. They just can't do any better, unfortunately. And this sort of person evokes feelings of pity. So you might patronize a store like that because you feel bad for them. But if the difference in price or quality, uh, speed, and all those sorts of things, if, they, if that difference grows to a certain point, you're going to give up on them. You're still going to go with the, with the retail giant instead. So clearly, the best type of middleman to deal with is the partner, both warm and competent. They have your best interests at heart, and they're really able to deliver on those good intentions. So I think everybody wants to deal with a partner, and everybody should want to be a partner. And a way to think about being a partner is going back to this idea of increasing the value of a network by connecting nodes. What partners are able to do is they're able to increase the size of the pie and then take as their slice you know, their markup, their commission, their fee. And after they take that slice for, for creating that extra value, you still feel like you are way better off than if you hadn't partnered with them. Okay, And so being a partner puts you in a very strong position because people really want to do business with you. They're not just doing business with you because they feel sorry for you or because they currently don't have any alternatives, but because you really are providing a great value to them. Okay, So this is my sort of foundation for everything I'm going to say today. We've got this idea of a good middleman. The admirable kind of middleman is a partner. They create value. You appreciate them. And then the question becomes, well, how exactly do they create value? You know, this is a very fuzzy notion of creating value by connecting nodes in a network. What is it that they're doing exactly? And this is really what most of my book is about. I distill it into six problems that middlemen solve, that good middlemen solve. And I think that you will all find yourself in a middleman position at some point. And I hope that as I continue discussing what these middlemen do, you'll see, yeah, sometimes I do that in my work, or I see somebody else doing that. And maybe I should be doing more of this. I hadn't thought of that. And that's, that's the idea anyway. So what do middlemen do to create value, to be a valued partner? Well, one of the, the very first problem that they solve is what I call the problem of distance. Distance can take many forms. There's, uh, well, three forms that I talk about anyway. There's physical, you know, geographic distance. That's pretty obvious. But you can also have temporal distance and social distance. So with physical distance, it's two people who want to who would both benefit from doing business together, 
some kind of trade, but they're just too far apart, and a merchant steps in and connects them that way indirectly. Okay, with temporal distance, we don't usually think of um, middlemen this way, but that's actually what a lot of them do. So my favorite example of this is an appliance flipper on Craigslist. I'm sure you guys have all used Craigslist. What this guy does is he's like a super user of Craigslist. He, um, a power user of Craigslist. He's just constantly on the site. He knows all about the prices for the kind of products that he buys and sells, because he has to. He lives off of that, that difference, that markup, you know, between what he buys for and what he sells for. So he'll buy a used washer and dry, or dryer for $50. That's the price he's aiming for. He'll do that on Saturday, take the appliance off of somebody's hands. He'll quickly turn around and post that same listing on Craigslist and then sit and wait and you know does his other work and sits and waits until somebody can match his asking price, which is typically $250 or $300. And then when that person comes back, it might be a couple days later, he sells it to them for that higher price. So they're a bridge in time. Right, they're a bridge between the seller on a Saturday and the buyer on a Monday or Tuesday. Social distance, this is another problem, and this is really the biggest problem of all, and it presents the most opportunity. Because what you often have, this is a very typical pattern for social networks, is that people tend to be with other people like them, right? Birds of a feather flock together is the saying. And so if you map the social structure, what you end up having is a cluster of people who all know each other here, and then another cluster here, and another cluster there. But then you have these gaps between the, the clusters. The structural holes is what uh, sociologists call them. And what structural holes do is they create you know, problems with transferring information, but they also create opportunities for middlemen who can act as bridges. Okay, they're bridging these gaps in the social fabric. Okay. So uh, an example, there's an entrepreneur I spoke with who, when she was a college student, saw an expectant mother, a heavily pregnant woman, putting up flyers in this young woman's dorm. She was looking for a nanny, and she thought, you know, there are so many college students, I'm bound to be able to find a nanny here. Now, this is in the Boston area, and there are just so many college students in the Boston area. It would be very inefficient to go and do this, and it's just silly for a uh, you know, expectant mother to be doing this, or for anybody to be doing this. And so you've got these, these people, right? There's a cluster of college students, many clusters of college students, and then you have many clusters of families, and the families may talk to each other, and the college students may talk to each other, but they're separated across social distance. And so what the entrepreneur did is she saw this bridging opportunity. This was in the early days of e-commerce, and she started a service called Sitter City that connects these two groups. And now we have many, many such services, and that doesn't seem so remarkable. But I'm just showing you this as an example of how even within a, the same geographic area, you might have the need for a bridge. Okay. All right. So this, this bridge in social structure is, is pretty foundational to a lot of the other problems, to solving a lot of the other problems that I'm going to describe. So let's take the problem of quality. This is another problem that middlemen solve. Whenever you're buying something, you're kind of at the mercy of the seller, because the seller typically knows more about what they're selling than you as the buyer do. All right, so classic example is a used car, right? If you're selling a used car, you know how well you've taken care of the car, what problems it has, and so on, and the buyer doesn't know that, right? And this, is, this creates a real problem for both sides, actually. This is what the whole market for lemons is about. You know, it's not just that the seller is suspicious of the buyer and is at a disadvantage. The buyer ends up being at a disadvantage just against other buyers because how can they prove how can, I mean sorry the seller how can the seller prove that the the car is in as good a condition as the seller knows it to be how can they justify that price 
So this is where a middleman can help because a middleman is doing trade constantly, right? If you're selling a car, you're doing it once every few years, but someone who specializes in selling cars is doing it all the time. So a really clear demonstration of how a middleman can solve this quality problem is apparent on eBay. Because on eBay, it's all right there. You can see who is doing the selling. You can see a record of their transactions over time. What everybody wants is a high feedback score on eBay because it makes buyers trust that person more, right? The problem is it's very hard to build up that kind of positive score, that positive reputation on eBay, if you're only selling occasionally. You see, this is why being a middleman gives you an advantage because one of many reasons is that you're, you're buying and selling a lot, and so you can much more quickly build up a reputation as someone who delivers on the quality that they're promising. Okay. Now people, so one of the people I interviewed for the book is, is a woman who is a power seller on eBay. Power seller is eBay's designation for its most uh, active and reputable sellers. She gave up a career as an appellate lawyer to sell luxury designer goods on eBay because, gosh, it was just, you know, this is a quick way to become an entrepreneur. And she's an expert on this stuff. That's one of the keys. You have to really be good at sussing out quality. And she's staking her reputation on everything that she sells on the site. She really guards that average you know, feedback score on eBay because she knows that all her future sales depend on it. So this is the advantage that a middleman has. They're expert in quality, and they're really able to lay a, um, their reputation on the line with every sale. So I call this type of middleman the certifier. And by the way, in the, we often talk about people saying things like, we don't need gatekeepers. You know, gatekeepers are evil. Let's bypass the gatekeepers. Let's do our own thing. Well, gatekeepers are actually very valuable for this very reason. You know, it's in their interest to close the gates when you know, crap is coming through and to open them up when they see something of quality. And when we're buying as, you know, as consumers of, of goods, of cultural products, it's valuable to use the services of the gatekeeper because we know that there's a stamp of approval. You're not going to see um, a lot of schlock through a gate, go through a great uh, gatekeeper. All right. So the third problem is the problem of accountability. Accountability is related to the problem of quality, except with quality, you're just dealing with goods. With accountability, you're dealing with services. So let's say you need to hire somebody how do you know, regardless of that person's track record or underlying quality, how do you know that they're going to deliver for you, that they're going to do a good job for you? And again, you have the same problem that the infrequent seller or the infrequent buyer does in the certifier scenario. If you're only selling something, a service occasionally, how can you prove that you really are an honest, accountable person who works hard and so on. And as the buyer, how can you ascertain that as well? So again, middlemen to the rescue. I'll give you an example, a modeling agent. An agent who represents models for photographers or um, brands that need to hire models. This is a person who's keeping both sides honest. I'm using that as an umbrella term, keeping both sides honest, to capture that whole notion of accountability that can take many forms. So in the case of a model, being accountable means that you're going to show up. That's the main thing. You're going to show up on time, which by the way in the modeling world means 15 minutes or at least 15 minutes before the shoot starts. And for the other side, the photographer, the brand who's taking pictures, that they stick to the letter of the contract, that they uphold the contract terms. So if they are allowed to use these images in a catalog, because that's what they paid for, the agency, the middleman in this transaction, is going to make sure that they don't slap on those pictures on a big billboard. So the middleman is able to keep both sides accountable. A model might still flake out, but she'll be less likely to flake out 
when she's being represented by the agency. And the reason is that the agency is in a position to have her brought in again and again and again. So she's got a longer future horizon when working through the agency than if she's doing business directly with a photographer. Then she can say, oh, it's not worth it for me. Something, you know, a better gig came up. I'll just cancel on you or whatever. So that's an example of accountability. And it happens, it happens everywhere. So, OK, we've talked about these several problems. I'll also present the problem of risk. And of course, all of these things that I've been talking about, the problem of quality and the problem of accountability, do have to do with risk. And that is the risk that what you're buying isn't what you thought you would get. Okay, But when I talk about the middleman as a risk bearer, I'm really talking about a different kind of risk. And that is the kind of risk that neither side can predict. Okay, a lot of services in the on-demand economy actually deal with this kind of risk. It's those unpredictable fluctuations in demand. You know, when are you going to need to call up a car? You know, uh, when is a car going to be in this neighborhood? None of these services know when each of these events is going to happen, but because they're pooling all these resources, they're kind of building like a portfolio, you might say, then in the aggregate, they do know that at this time, you're going to have somebody who's going to need a car in this neighborhood, and you're going to have a driver that's within a certain radius of this, of this neighborhood. So that's risk pooling. That's the risk bearing role. And often it has to work hand in hand with these other types of risk, the quality problem and the accountability problem. A clear demonstration of this is with a service called ZocDoc. It's another one of these two-sided marketplaces. It's sort of the open table for doctor's appointments. Okay. So if you need to see a doctor on short notice, you can go to this website and find someone in your area, in, your specialty, in the specialty that you're looking for. And for the doctors, who are the ones who are paying for this service, because it's, you know, it's free to the patients, for the doctors, uh, this is a great service, just like Open Table is for restaurants, because they often have last minute cancellations, and they, are, they rather fill that appointment slot. Right? So for each doctor, it's unpredictable when that opening is going to show up. But for, um, you know, for the site, for the service as a whole, for ZocDoc, it's quite predictable that, yes, we can really count on there being a certain number of openings, and we can count on a certain amount of demand from patients. And you have to keep those in balance. But, but here's the interesting part, is that it really has to work hand in hand with the work of accountability and the work of, of sussing out quality. Because you're going to run into this problem. Who do you think will be the doctors with the most openings? Right? That's the kind of risk. Doctors who are, who are not very good, who have not been able to build up a very good reputation in their community. So everybody's going to have you know, these flukes, like you know, very uh, honest reasons for having an opening. But doctors who have a disproportionately high number of openings, you have to wonder about these doctors. And ZocDoc, as a middleman, has to protect themselves from that kind of risk. right? They have to weed out the bad doctors. But they have to embrace the other kind of risk, which is that nobody knows when you're going to have an opening. OK, so the, you know, this is where these reputation systems come in. It's almost, it's almost an industry standard now that all of these sites have a way for users to evaluate the other side. At least in this case, patients evaluate doctors. And when doctors know that they're going to be evaluated, they're going to be presumably on better behavior. So they're not going to maybe keep you waiting as long as they would if you were not transacting through the middleman. At least that's the theory. And it's in ZocDoc's interest to keep that system working very well. OK, so, so that's the risk bearer role. And again, it comes up uh, in, in lots of other places. OK, there, there's another problem. And uh, I would call this the problem of information overload. Okay, I think um, 
Google certainly understands this problem. It's like the official you know, mission of the company to organize all the world's information. And a lot of people don't appreciate this, that the more information you have, that's not necessarily a good thing by itself, because then you have the problem of sifting through this information, processing the information to make a good decision. Okay. And, um, Herbert Simon said pretty famously, you guys might have heard this quote, that a wealth of information creates a poverty of attention. And by attention, he just meant time. Information consumes time. If you've ever had to plan a complex trip, uh, you, you probably can relate to this. You know, humans actually have a, a much harder time than computers in processing information because we get overwhelmed, we get emotionally overwhelmed, and so we just get paralyzed with indecision. And so this is another rationale for a middleman to step in. So um, I call this role the concierge role, just like you could do your own research on whatever city you're going to, through your iPad or whatever, or you can go to a concierge who can just cut through all of that and tell you exactly where to go to meet your needs. So that is the that is the concierge role. And you know, I think computers are gonna be doing more and more of that, but we're not there yet. We still can really benefit from a good concierge. By the way, this is where I think real estate agent, uh, real estate agents can really step up their game. We no longer need real estate agents to just tell you what the listings are, you know, if we're buying a house, but we need them to guide us through this long, complex, high stakes transaction. And uh, I think that they could be doing a better job at that if they, if they thought of their role that way. All right, finally, the, the last problem that I think middlemen solve is, is the problem that I'll just call um, self-advocacy, the problem of self-advocacy, which is the problem of trying to advocate on your own behalf. So we, just as, as humans, we have a hard time tooting our own horn. Much easier if somebody else does that for us, if somebody else introduces us, if somebody else says how, you know, how great we are. And also the problem of pushing for what we want. We're afraid of rocking the boat. And one of the middlemen I interviewed uh, for, the, for this book really saw this problem in his industry. And we already see this in other industries, like in sports agents, right? They advocate on the athletes, so the, uh, on behalf of the athletes. So the athlete doesn't have to, not only does the athlete not have to become an expert in negotiation, but the athlete can just pretend that they're just interested in the game, right? Let the business side um, be taken care of by the middleman. The, the person that I talk to does the same thing for young doctors. So he's a doctor himself, a more seasoned doctor, and he's seen both sides. Middlemen often do have to be able to appreciate the needs of both sides. And he realized that young doctors are at a disadvantage in negotiating for their first job out of a residency or medical school. And the disadvantages, well, there are many disadvantages. One is they just don't even have the information. They don't have experience negotiating. But they're also hamstrung by the fact that throughout medical school, it has been pounded into them that medicine is a higher calling. It's not about the money. And you shouldn't show an interest in money when you're talking to your future employer. But hospitals and clinics take advantage of that norm. And uh, so, they're able to get these young doctors to just sign whatever the first offer is. Okay, so this agent is able to step in and he's able to say things like, well, I know you really need an ER doctor. And I know that the median pay in Kansas City for an ER doctor is X. And so let's just move toward X with, with this person who's a young hire. We don't know anything about his quality, so let's just take the median salary as our target. There's just no way that the doctor, even if the doctor had that information, would feel comfortable saying these things on her own behalf. Okay, so that's the value that, that um, this, this role that I call the insulator provides. So what's interesting about all of these is they all show they're all able to wield power on behalf of their client, on behalf of their trading partner, going back to this idea of being an admirable middleman, a true partner. But they're able to do it without any kind of a formal authority. 
You know, it's not like anybody's reporting to this person. But we're all gladly partnering with these people. We're all happily using these services because these businesses are providing true value to both sides. And I want to just leave you with this thought about how this might apply to you and how you can be, how can you start to see yourself as, as a middleman as well. So this diagram shows somebody's actual map of their LinkedIn connections. LinkedIn um, no longer offers this visualization service, but if you were to manually map all your connections, I would bet that your diagram, your own personal network diagram, would look much like this. And this person right here in the middle is the user whose connections are being mapped here. And all these colors, they refer to a cluster. Remember I was talking about a typical social network having clusters and having bridges, right? And gaps between clusters that can be bridged. So the blue cluster are all employees of one company. And maybe the orange cluster is employees of a previous employer that this person has worked for. And I think the green cluster refers to the, some classmates from college. And the smallest cluster is typically your family members. Again, all these people know each other, more or less, because they're in the same social circle. That's what we would say, social circle. But they don't all know each other across clusters. And in this case, you sometimes have people who overlap. But the most prominent bridge is the user, him or herself. This is the person who is a bridge across all of these clusters. So the idea here is that we're all separated, but we're all part of a bunch of networks. And if we can think of ourselves as being that middle man, that middle person, the, the person who can bridge all of these different networks, then we can increase the value of our whole network. And we can do it through these ways of being uh, not just a bridge, but also a certifier, right? Or an enforcer, the accountability role, or perhaps an insulator when you're saying something on behalf of a coworker um, that they can't say on behalf of themselves. That's how you can be a more valuable middleman yourself. Um, so you mentioned that um, historically we have viewed middlemen as um, something that we revile, right? Uh, however, clearly, like you said, uh, most of the services that we work with are essentially middlemen. Um, why do you think the social perception has changed for middlemen? Like, why don't we revile like Amazon or Google as we would? I don't know, an older uh, middleman. Yeah, well, there are a lot of answers to that question. So first of all, middlemen as a group are still reviled. You'll still, you know, I follow this word on Twitter because I, I want to join conversations about middlemen. And people still say things like, oh, cut out the middleman. This service cuts out the middleman. And they're not seeing that, well, this service actually is a middleman, too. <laughs> so that, that's one thing I would say. In general, people still don't have this like negative view of middlemen. And a lot of people wouldn't see Amazon as a middleman. Um, another answer is that Amazon, I would put in that, quad, in that golden quadrant of being a partner, at least from the consumer side. If you talk to you know, small manufacturers or try to um, sell through Amazon, you might hear a different answer. So I think that the ones that we look to as, as admirable ones, we just don't call them a middleman. So, so middleman is a more sort of semantic thing then, or that we just call things that Middlemen that we don't like middlemen, but the middlemen that we like, we don't realize yeah, that they are middlemen. I do think it's largely a semantic issue. Yes, that if we like them, we call them you know, a retailer. Or you know, my, my trusted agent, we don't use the word middleman. I think so. Can you talk a little bit about the role of universities as middlemen? Because to some extent, they're certifiers and networks and 
yeah, universities are definitely middlemen for, for the reason that you identified. Uh, a lot of people would say that that's actually their main role is just to certify you, you know, like, oh, you got into MIT. Well, that's good enough for me. I don't even care what you learn at MIT, right? So that certifier role is really important. Um, they actually work as middlemen in other ways, too, because there's a real uh, at least a two-sidedness, you know, the idea of a two-sided market where, you know, everybody wants to be, the buyers want to be where the sellers are, the sellers want to be where the buyers are. There is a way in which universities are like that. So if you think about a good university, they attract good students because they have great faculty and then great faculty want to work at a university that has smart, motivated students and, and there are other effects like that. So do you see any, any problems? Uh, I mean, all of this sounds excellent, but I'm thinking now of the uh, physician's uh, network that you mentioned. And do such middleman services actually create behaviors that otherwise would not be created? For example, you know, like, so, you know, like some people may think, you know, like, oh, this is a bad doctor. He treated me you know, like in, you know, like in a certain way, but you know, like, the doctor is actually, you know, like, you know, like his cure is performing well, but his, you know, like personal skills may not be up to par. So, you know, yes. like he gets, you know, like a bad review. And now you have this, you know, like network effects, which may be multiplying this and suddenly, you know, like strange things happen. Definitely. Yeah. That is not a perfect system uh, with ZocDoc. I mean, doctors, really think, and a lot of people would say this, gosh, what business do patients even have evaluating doctors? If you were as expert at medicine as the doctor is, why would you even need a doctor? And you could say that about any of these middlemen services. To, some, to a large extent, we turn to middlemen because we cannot, we just don't have that expertise ourselves. And, and so I would say that these services do uh, have um, these rating systems do skew the ratings in a certain direction that they measure certain things more than others. Clearly things like the doctor's bedside manner and how long they kept you waiting weigh heavily, much more heavily than other factors that somebody else would, would find important. Yeah, it's not a perfect system. Yeah, um, I was just trying to think about the role of technology in taking over middlemen roles. Yeah. And I was wondering if you have thoughts on are there certain roles or characteristics of these roles of middlemen that are inherently human that technology maybe conceivably could never take over? I really don't. I, I thought about this question as well. And I actually posed it um, to, um, to Al Roth. You guys know Al Roth. He's a an economist at, at Stanford. He won the Nobel Prize a couple years ago, and he thinks a lot about middlemen. Anyway, he, he says, no, that really, you, it, there's nothing you can say that is like that, because there's just no limit. We don't know what artificial intelligence is going to be able to do. I actually talk a little bit about this in this book. I mean, in the same way that we turn to Netflix with its you know, sophisticated collaborative filtering system to recommend movies that we're really going to love. Uh, there is no reason, in theory, you know, in my mind, why we can't someday turn to a sophisticated piece of software that will ask us you know, natural language questions to find out about our tastes and ask us to rate past experiences and, on the basis of that, construct the perfect itinerary for us. You know? That seems like an impossible challenge, but in theory, I don't see why it's not possible. I'll say one other thing about technology. Um, you know, the, part of the reason that people were saying that middlemen were going to go away is that the internet would reduce transaction costs, the, the cost of finding what you need and finding out about quality and so on. And it actually has done that. It's reduced transaction costs. And that's why we're able to you know, book our own travel so often. If you're just flying to LA or New York, staying at a hotel you've stayed at before, your transaction cost for doing that on your own is really quite low. And so it makes no sense to turn to a travel agent to do that. But the thing about transaction costs is that um, the internet has lower transaction costs for everybody, including middlemen. And so middlemen bring whatever human capital they have, whatever skills and knowledge they have, they bring it to the task. And then for them, the technology is a complement. So their transaction costs have actually fallen faster than our transaction costs have for the kind of you know, special complex transactions that we can't easily do ourselves, with, even with the aid of technology. 
correct, though, that they can never go to zero marginal cost for transaction. Yeah, I mean, yes, yeah, there's always going to be a, you know, no free lunch, right? Let's thank uh, Marina for our, her visit to Google. Thanks.